Okay, there's one more idiosyncrasy in Peter's meter which I need to cover because it'll be confusing. Um, maybe. Maybe you'll get it faster than I did. I've been pondering this for over an hour now. In the top, we still got Ephesians 1. Peter interleaving, I-N-T-E-R-L-E-A-V-I-N-G. Peter is interleaving his text into Paul to update Paul for the effect of the 490, the temple 490. In other words, Paul's talking about, you know, historic, what future Roman history is going to be, first with respect to Rome, then with respect to whether believers are maturing enough for the rapture to occur. That's Paul's focus in the meter. Peter's looking at the other issue about the Temple 490, which is that are enough believers being developed analogous to enough believers in Israel in the Old Testament to justify the temple still standing? See, that was the rule in 1 Kings 9. If people will turn their face to the temple and they will, you know, want to learn God at all, then the temple will stay standing. So by analogy, will there be enough believers who will care to learn Bible doctrine so that as it were, the temple of believers will actually get built? That's a different question from whether the church will mature enough for the rapture to occur. Okay, the church maturing for the rapture to occur is Paul's theme, and he gets to the climax of that theme in Ephesians 4.13. But it's... It's also a question whether there's going to be enough believers who even care to learn. Because if believers are too negative, then the rapture happens for the wrong reason. And time ends. And of course, it would still be the rapture. Israel's time would still return. And, you know, Satan will think he's won, which of course he does. That's, you know, Revelation 9 and 12. That's what the, that's telling you. But, you know... It, the whole temple, as it were, of believers can tank if there aren't enough believers. That's what Peter's telling you, is yes, there will be enough believers to justify, as it were, a temple of believers on earth, a body of Christ. Not whether the body's mature, just whether there's going to be one. All right. In order to develop this, he interleaves his text, as I've shown you before. By the time you get down here, though, all right, he has stopped with this verse. He tags Paul, ending at Paul's 350. Okay, and that's here in the upper thing. Okay, Paul's 350, you got to kind of there. See, Paul's 350 is, this goes to 343, all right, and then this goes to 350. All right, because he's ending he's ending the third quarter of church here, and then church goes into winter apostasy. All right, this is the last period of any great growth church is going to have is post Constantine outside of Constantine's realm. Okay, because Constantine dies here, and then his sons start fighting over whether God is one or three. So you know their kingdom is just completely gone. They're completely political. God's just, you know, a football team. Literally, it was in the circus. In Circus Maximus, they actually had teams. The green team and the blue team about whether God was one or three. And then they beat each other up after each game. That's how bad it was. That's how cheaply they held God. Okay. Even so, during that time, Bible was circulated and it was especially free outside of Rome because you didn't have all those political factions like the groups of the Circus Maximus. And there's a lot of stories about how silly that was. Okay? So the third quarter of church ends badly. So Peter, interleaving his text, will be interleaving his text here. Okay? 332 to 350. Okay? So... 332 is actually starting here with Autu. All right? Tu spral picotas en tu Cristo. Okay? Constantine dies here. 
his sons start warring immediately, they start killing all their cousins. All right, the whole family dies out before 360. All right, 368, I think it was. All right, the family, the whole Constantinian family dies out because they all start murdering each other over whether God is one or three. So that's the brouhaha going on in Rome. All right, so what's going on underneath? 350 is where Peter interleaves. So he's interleaving to this section of Paul's text. Okay? Really important. Why, what does it mean when he's now bringing you to 350 here also? Okay? Now he's sort of been doing that, but it's not been uniform. See, this is 332. This is 3.30, so there's sometimes a hiatus. But here he's deliberately doing a double, a doubling again, and this is, you know, divisible by 7. So it's real important that he's hooking it here. And the other thing that makes this important is Peter's going to focus on it in his letter, is this is the number of syllables in Psalm 90. Okay, the last two verses end with a cliffhanger where Moses says, establish the work of our hands. He's talking about temple rebuilding there. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Okay, he's predicting that the temple that wasn't even built yet is going to go down. And of course, that's exactly what's the problem here, is that the temple of believers has gone down into apostasy, into political church, that started under Constantine right in here. And then here's where Constantine dies. He's so bad, he doesn't even get to count his first fruits. See, that, that, that word in Greek, prodikotas, means first fruits. Okay, Constantine dies here. Big failure. Real pointed. Real nasty. Paul's always focusing on the Adas for the deaths of Caesar in his meter. It's really embarrassing. All right, so why is Peter tying to this? What is he doing when he ties to this? <clears throat> he's tying to it the first time with this phrase, all right? And he's tying to it the second time, and this is really shocking to me, with this phrase. Okay, so let's go through that a little bit. Hopefully my um, recorder will still work. If you hear noise in the background, that's my dryer going because I needed it to be on. Okay, so, dus pro el picotas en doy cristoy. All right? And that means the first fruits of those trusting in Christ. Okay, see? This is the end of the Apinon Anaphora, the second benchmark. To the end, for the reason that we be made into the praise of his glory. The English here that I translated matches the meter. I'm using the same number of syllables in English so you get a better sense of it. So here, tus pro el picotas en toi cristoi. Tus pro el picotas en toi cristoi. The first fruits of those trusting in Christ. All right? So that's 343 and then gets to 350 by saying, en hoy cajumes acusantes, in whom even you also hearing. All right, so now Peter's going to talk to that. See? O misomenoi do telos des pristes hunen soterian psuke. Okay? And the usual translation in English, and it's not bad, it just sounds all churchy. Obtaining the end, the result of the salvation of your souls. Now notice the, the, the parallel here. Okay. This is starting. Oh, I'm sorry that the monitor is lagging here. Okay, this ends at 3:32. Okay, so it starts at 3:13. This is 3:13 to 3:32 A.D. 332 All right. So to tack to it here, we got to go basically from Telematos Auto his will, his good pleasure, to doxis, 
All right, so the text would be the lemma to shall to I stoy ne chemas I sepain on doxis. All right, and you don't need out to here to get complete the meaning. All right, his will, his good standard, his delight, his will and purpose. Okay, for his standard of delight really is being the focus to the end that to the end that with the purpose that we become the praise of his glory all right the parallel text in Peter starts right here up with the the result that you obtain the salvation with the end that totelos okay obtaining the result of your faith the salvation of your souls He's not talking about salvation to heaven here. He's talking about your soul being kitted out with Christ's thinking. See, your body and juridically you're saved the minute you believe Christ paid for your sins. But you still got the same old thinking in your soul. What's going to save your soul? James was talking about the same thing in the book of James. Receive the implanted word which is able to save your soul. Your soul still needs to be saved from its trashed up thinking. It needs to be saved from thinking that this life is all there is. It needs to be saved from having such low standards that life is about eating and peeing and fornicating and brother and sister and father and mother. There's something higher than that to live for. Because sooner or later, everything in this life is going to desert you. Sooner or later, everything in this life is going to become boring. What do you live for then? Okay? So what's going to save your soul from the boring lowness of life? Well, living for God. Okay, but how can you live for God if you don't know God? Okay? So that's what he's talking about here. Obtaining the purpose of your faith, the salvation of your souls. What's the point of being saved to heaven if you still got the same old thinking? No purpose at all. Then you're just a baby in heaven, which is how a lot of believers are going to turn out. So see, from 3.13 to 3.32... Peter is playing on what Paul is saying. See, Paul's saying it's God's good will <clears throat> that you be made into praise for his glory. That's higher than just being saved. You get that, right? It's one thing to be saved so you're not in hell. Okay, but what's on top of that? To be able to glorify God. Because now you've got a higher reason to live than just being saved from hell. <clears throat> See, it's one thing to be saved from a bad place. What about the good place you go to? And what kind of good place is it going to be if you got the same old thinking that would have ended you up in hell in the first place? See, you got to have replacement thinking. That's what the spiritual life is about. That's why you don't die the minute that you're saved. Okay? There's a new purpose for your life. Right here. Obtaining the outcome of your faith, which is the salvation of your soul. Not just your juridical position. If all you got saved was your body so you don't go to hell. What about what you're thinking? See, you, you need more than that. And if your thinking is made into Christ's, well then obviously that would be God's delight to hear you think like Christ. And then you would be praised for his glory, wouldn't you? And what's so shocking about that verse highlighted now in black and gold is it's saying that's exactly what we become. Can you imagine getting rid of the lowly thinking we got down here where we have to be concerned about Johnny's haircut, the dry cleaning, and whether or not we've backed up our computer and instead of actually being thinking like Christ himself, having that much of a higher lifestyle inside our heads. Is there any greater value than that? To think like Christ? To have the happiness of Christ? To have this whole virtue of his thinking? Surely that would praise God's glory to be like that. And that verse highlighted in black and gold is saying that's exactly how we will be. That's the purpose of life. Okay? Obtaining as the purpose the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Save from all the low thinking we got down here. When is our next meal? What boyfriend do we have? 
What dress do I wear to a party? Does so-and-so like me? I mean, all that petty, ugly thinking. It's not sin, but it's certainly low and boring. I mean, don't you get bored when somebody goes on and on about their brother, their sister, their father, their mother, or my child just said his first words. Yeah, but it's not your kid. And they'll go on and on and on and on about Johnny drooled and Johnny had his diapers changed and I gave Johnny a haircut. Well, okay, that's their life. You can appreciate that. They're not sinning. But honey, who wants to listen to it? So why should God want to hear our petty thinking? What will save us from this body of death? Thanks be to God in Christ Jesus. I can have a higher life than the one I got down here. You see the point? So Peter is now adopting a sort of postscript to what Paul is saying here. Okay? A postscript. What about this higher life? Especially since, hello, from this point onward, from 335 all the way down to 352, see? We're entering the winter time of church. So only a few crops are going to be there. That's why first fruits is so important. The first crop was Paul and his generation. After that, those hearing him. But they are also a first fruits for their generation. Okay, and they are few. There's no big growth. It's the last period of big growth. Okay, after that, it's winter. And now he's talking to the second generation in whom you also hear it. And so Peter's talking to him too. Obtaining as the outcome of your souls, the salvation of your souls. Because why? In whom you're also hearing. What are you hearing? The divine word of truth. Okay? So Peter's talking about that. What's the divine word of truth? Old Testament, New Testament. So look how cleverly Peter launches next. Otherwise, the text doesn't make sense why he says this next. Concerning which salvation, making diligent searches and inquiries, the prophets, meaning Old Testament, or how do I want to put this in good English? Because it's, it's, very, it's very wicked um, Greek. Concerning this salvation, making diligent inquiries and searches, the prophets, meaning the prophets of old, concerning this grace to you that we've preached I mean that see he's he's like doing it in backwards order okay the best way to translate this that's why people have trouble with Peter the prophets of old concerning the grace which we preached to you they made diligent searches and inquiries because why because you're getting the divine word of truth see this is tying to 368 right here. This is going from 350 to 368. So now you have to make the next thing. The official announcement of your salvation. See? The grace that we've preached to you. What is that grace about? The salvation. Concerning the salvation. And I'm thinking that's why Peter's wording it in like reverse order. Because this is going to tie all the way to 368. Okay? So he's talking about the salvation first. Because Paul is ending it here, see? It basically ends it. So, ter, ri, as, see, ri, as, humon. Last four. Okay, so he's ending it at 368, and that would basically get you to so, ter. All right? So, the, you know, the gospel of your salvation. You don't need the ri, as at the end to know that it's saying salvation. Okay? So because Paul, he's tacking the Paul's meter there at the end, he's making his section of it begin where Paul's is ending because he's going to end at the same place. Diligent searches and inquiries. I mean, I'm not 100% sure why he's doing it that way, but this sure looks like it would make sense if he did. See, because you also hearing the word of truth the official announcement of your salvation is going to be the whole text to which Peter is tying. So he's wrapping around it by talking about the salvation message first. 
concerning the salvation of prophets of old in the word of truth, dying to Paul, made diligent searches and inquiries about what we've preached to you. You see, I think that's got to account for why the word order is so weird. Because this is really weird word order in Greek. It's very, it's like very convoluted. Okay? Normally you would be mentioning the prophets first, although they do have this construction where you have the verbs and then the subject. But usually the subject precedes the verb. Okay? But he wants to stress salvation. And so he puts the verb in front of it. The diligent searches and inquiries. The prophets of all. Concerning what was preached to you, grace from us. See, that's kind of out of order. So he's, he's trying to make, he's trying to wrap around Paul's order by doing it in reverse order. That's the only thing I can think of. Now, the whole reason I want to bring this up is that from 350 onward, because Paul is saying this is the winter of church. See, this is the last productive period. After that, it's only going to be handfuls of Christians who mature in Christ. That's why the rapture is so late in occurring. There's not one subset of sevens until he gets to 91 at 434. So I think what Peter's trying to do is he, he turns the, the meter. He doesn't do any more sevening based on Paul. Because Paul isn't doing any 70 until he gets to the end. So he takes this. This becomes his jumping off point. <coughs> Excuse me. And this whole thing with no more sevens except here, but it doesn't, cumul cumulative doesn't become seven. He just goes right straight to here. This is where he ends with Paul. See, Paul ends there. But in the total meter text, rather than the year, see, he's tying to the year of Paul here. But in the total meter text, he's gone way beyond Paul. He's, he's now well into Odovacher. Odovacher starts to rise here, really about here. He gets his own prophecy that he's going to become important. During this time, church is so apostate, the bishops are trying to control the emperors, and the emperors are fighting with each other over whether God is one or three, and then they're fighting with each other over who's more holy. And then there are child emperors who are ruled by their advisors, who are ruled by the bishops. It's, it's just, it's a sick time in history. God doesn't mean anything to these people. So, that's why there's no orange. Okay? And that's why Peter's no longer tracking to Paul directly. All right? It's all a postscript is what I'm trying to say. And it's not until he gets here, mimicking the fact that Paul has no submeters until he gets to 91. So to Peter only, it's 350 to 434, which is an 84, which means the will of God gets comp accomplished anyway. But the quarter is still short because church isn't over yet. Because the rapture still has to happen, it can happen at the wrong time. You see the, the cleverness of this? But what I'm trying to say here is all this text in Peter, verse 10 through 12, which does start a new paragraph, because he's talking about the prophets of old. See, because Paul was talking about, Paul was talking about divine word of truth here. You also hearing the next crop, hearing the divine word of truth, the official announcement of your salvation, Peter's keying off that to say how these believers are still going to be enough that the temple will remain standing owing to the prophets of old writing what they wrote because the Bible will be preserved. Okay? The times. So he's talking about the times. They were looking at the time of, of Christ coming. We're looking back on the cross, okay? And Christ is risen, okay? And so we look back on his suffering and the glories to come. We're part of the glories to come. See, that's how Paul ends this. This is the Apinon Anaphora. For the purpose of the praise of his glory. You see how Peter's tying to that? 
right there. All right, see, because that takes you to 431. So treat all of this from 350 forward as a kind of postscript that sort of is intended to explain further the winter of church, why nobody's growing. That even though nobody's growing, there's enough positive volition to God, meaning positive volition of Bible, meaning preservation of Bible, such that, as it were, the temple of believers can even remain standing. Now, if I haven't made that clear, I apologize. Ask me questions, and I'll try to do it again. Peace out.